Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Everybody give him a Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That every day, every day, every day, every one of us can come before you, Lord, in great praise because of your faithfulness, because of the joy that you bring us. We can come with new mercies every morning. We can come confidently into your presence every day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your course with praise. Amen? Amen. Come on, heaven is a child of God today. Are you a son and daughter of the Most High God? Give him a shout today. Come on. All right, let's bow it out.
Thank you, Lord. We children of love today, Lord, we're calling out with thanksgiving to our God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the keys to the kingdom. You haven't closed the gates. <laughs> you've said that the gates are open. Enter into those gates with thanksgiving, into the courts with praise. So, Lord, with thankfulness, with gratefulness in our hearts for your faithfulness the joy that you bring us for setting us free for pulling us out of that pit placing our feet on solid ground thank you Lord for your love for us that never ends we thank you so come on let gratefulness thankfulness rise up in your heart toward your God who's the same yesterday today and forever who's delivered you so many times and still every day saves you. I choose this day to be grateful, Lord. I give you praise with an open heart. I'm waking up to
thankfulness rise within you. Think about his rescue every day. He loved you enough not to leave you alone. Keep pursuing you with his love. Just thank him. Just thank him from your heart. Just thank him now. Just lift your praises to your king. Just thank him. screens as we continue on in our new message series. Wow. We have so many reasons to be thankful, don't we? Mm-hmm. I mean, we have so many reasons to be thankful. Consider right now that the God who made everything you've ever seen, touched, tasted, or encountered, the God of mountains and valleys, the God of summer and winter, the God of every continent, the God of every moment, He knows you by name. He knows everything about you. He knows the best of your highlight reel and your fail films. And He chooses you with delight today. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We have so much to be thankful for. And I know for some of you, for really, let me just say it, for all of us, 2020 has been a hard year, right? 2020 has been a heavy year. 2020 has been a year of substance. But what I heard before the Lord this morning that you needed to remember is the substance and the weight of 2020 is not greater than the substance of Christ in you. There's someone greater in you than the system and pattern of this world. And when you understand that, you elevate above the world to go and carry hope to the world. A lot of people refer to this as a season of giving. And we said that we, as the church of the living God, want to celebrate that. But then we want to elevate that to the level that we feel is worthy of our Savior. Because He hasn't called us just to a season of giving. He's called us into an invitation to give our very lives, to be caught up with Him in His rescue mission for the entire planet. And we get to do that. My mind this morning turns to Luke chapter 9, where Jesus said these words. 
It says, Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple. Anybody in the room want to be Jesus' disciple? Anybody want to follow Jesus? I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. I used to only see that in a negative light. When I was first coming, I was like, oh man, that's, that's death, right? To take up your cross is to be crucified, and that's, <laughs> that's tough. Not a lot of people want to sign up for that. I thought it only meant that people aren't going to like you and life's going to be hard. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow him, if the world hated him, it's going to hate you. But there's actually a lot more going on in this verse that if you'd get it, you'd understand the invitation. It's an invitation that I could only call co, co, co. There are some things that, that the Bible says about Jesus that it says you experienced it with him. For instance, Jesus was crucified, but did you know that if you're in Christ, you were co-crucified with Christ? See, Jesus was crucified. He was put on a cross. He breathed his last. But listen to me. If you are in Christ, the old you before Christ has already been crucified. It already breathed its last. It can't resurrect back up again. It's gone. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're told we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, and you know the glorious truth? That means you don't wrestle against yours anymore either. Somebody get excited about that this morning. You're not your own worst enemy. You're not, I need to fix this and I need to fix this and then maybe I'll be enough for God. No, he already decided once and for all when he was crucified, he said anybody who comes in union with me will be crucified with me. Which means you're not who you used to be anymore. But there's a second co in that. You weren't just co-crucified, you were co-resurrected. Easter morning, Jesus breathed his first in newness of life, and he stepped out of the grave, laid down the grave clothes, left them behind, and lived a new life. And if you are in Christ, you've been co-resurrected. You're already resurrected in newness of life. The Bible says already, somehow, you're here, but you're actually seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're already reigning with him. There's more substance to you than you know. So listen, for some of you who feel 2020 has been kicking your butt, I want to say I get it and I know, but wake up, look in the mirror and remember who you are. If you are in Christ, the substance that is in you. Man, stuff started breaking. Come on, Jesus. If you are in Christ, the substance that is in you is the great, it's greater than any substance of any kingdom that can ever be shaken. And you've been raised to newness of life. You've been co-resurrected. But it's not just that. See, you were co-crucified, you were co-resurrected, but there's one more we don't talk about a whole lot. Did you know the Bible says, in Greek, it says, if you're in Christ, you were co-glorified with Christ. You remember when Jesus came out from the tomb, he raised in a new body, and he raised in a new body that carried this different weight, this different glory, and people didn't recognize him from what he used to look like before. You see where I'm going there? See, when you come to Christ, there's a new glory. It's not something you do. It's not something you accomplish. It's no different than, you know, I've had the opportunity to officiate a lot of weddings. I've had the opportunity to get married. I've got to tell you, when I stood at the altar, between the, 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 um, before this witness, as I proclaimed this man and, and woman, husband and wife, I know what it is, I say it a lot. <laughs> when they make that declaration, I want you to understand, before they make that declaration and after, there's not a single fact I learned about my wife. But the minute they said, husband and wife, we entered a new union. I was in a new, any, any married people, can you relate with that? You watch a couple, they get married, they go off, and they come back from their honeymoon, and you go, there, there's a different union about you. You left as two, you're, you're literally one person now. It's, it's different, there's a different substance. And listen, if you're in Christ, when you were raised up with him, whether you know it or not, there's a new glory, and you don't look like you used to look. People won't recognize you the way they used to, because Christ in you is the hope of glory. Your union with Christ infuses you with a glory that makes the substance in you different and the world has to stop and take notice. It's better than just that, though, because the glory that's in you, there's no one on this earth quite like you. Maybe somebody's told you that before. There's nobody like you. You're like Gonzo and the Muppets. Nobody's like you. There's not another one. And there's a glory in you that will never be replicated again. There's something that Jesus wants to do in his union with you that he will never do quite that way again. What an invitation! What a thing to get excited about when we get up in the morning. We've been called... 
to receive from the depths of who we are in intimacy with God this glory and then to release it liberally to the world. And so this series that we're walking in is how we can actually do that in community. It wouldn't just be me living my mission. We talk a lot about that in America. I'm going to live my mission for Christ. I'm going to be fired up for Christ. No, it's about we walk in a way that we're actually the body of Christ, walking with Christ as our head, and we see Brandon and the Bay and beyond change for the glory of God. Last week, we started sharing practically what that looked like. We looked at two of our missional communities that are standing on the front lines of loving orphans and seeing families reunified. And I want to let you know that these two missional communities that took part of this, um, Josh and Courtney Lambert, amazing job in their leadership, um, had a, hosted an at-home gala for A Door of Hope last week between the Sunday morning service and, and last Sunday night at their house. You guys raised $14,000 for foster families in Tampa Bay. That's enough to license four foster families. So that's actually going to happen. You've just launched four more in the Tampa Bay area. Man, that's so good. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to take a step up from that. We're going to go on a trip together. We're going to go up to 35,000 feet. And I want to look at the whole picture and what it would look like of where we're going as a church and where you have an invitation to take the glory that's in you, meet it with the glory in me, and change something in this region for his name. But I can't tell this story alone. In fact, through the series, you're going to hear, just like I did last week, I'm going to bring some people to help tell the story because Christ in them is helping write the story. And today I want to bring up two that I could only define as architects. That as they've stood, they've stood with us and dreamed and prayed what it would look like for us to live in a way that is missional, to be lifestyle missionaries. And so they're going to join me for the service today. If you could please give a very warm overflow welcome to our missions pastors, Mickey and Aaron Aruda. Come on up, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, I'm telling you. I like your sticker. Looks good. <laughs> Follow the procedures. It's for the kids. That's good. Well, listen, I've got, I've got a lot of questions that I want us to talk about. But first, as I've been thinking about uh, Mickey and Aaron and their family and the treasure they are to, to Jill and, and me and our family, I've been thinking a lot about your journey at Overflow Church. And so how many years have you been at Overflow now? Six. Six years, you're getting ready to go to kindergarten. That's awesome. Um, when you came to Overflow Church, you had showed up as uh, Aaron, as Michael and Kathy Tafflinger, our elder's daughter, which you still are, which is awesome. Um, but you showed up married, three kids, successful realtors. And what you said was, we just want to come and just, you know, just be, just be members at the church. Mm-hmm. Surprise! <laughs> um, God had other plans there. And so where it started was, Pastor Ken stood up on the platform. He, uh, pastor Ken was our outreach pastor for many years. Stood on the platform and talked about a trip they were taking to Haiti. And you said a phrase that I've come to hear so many times through the years. It's just simply, well, we'll go. We'll go. And so you joined in with the team. And what you didn't know was that Pastor Ken had been praying for some time. That there was a time for a transition of his leadership. In fact, before Pastor Ken became our outreach pastor, he was already retired. He just came back out of retirement to be um, a, an outreach pastor, and he felt like the Lord was saying that the time is coming to pass the baton, and he was waiting. And he was in Haiti with the two of you, and he heard, it's time, and it's them. And so he came back, he met with the elders and pastors, and we immediately saw what he saw. And to Pastor Ken's great credit, he set you guys up so beautifully for success taking you before the orphanage, continuing to walk with you in any way to support. And under the foundation that he built, we've watched it just expand to the point that now it's not just that our church is supporting the orphanage. You've actually set up individual sponsorships for all the kids that come in the orphanage. So I've got a a picture at my house of of a family that we are supporting, that we're coming around. You've, You've walked in medical efforts of what it would look like here in the future to have a running clinic in Haiti and to see things turn around. In fact, um, next week, Pastor Lucian is coming here to Overflow Church. And so we're going to get a report from him of exactly what's going on there. But you came back from, from uh, Haiti not just being members, but now you're the liaisons. You're the leaders to the ministry in Haiti. And you thought that was it. That's what we're going to do. Surprise. <laughs> Pastor Lynn stood up and he talked about another region of the world. He talked about Nigeria. And as he started to share where they were, he shared the heartbreak and your hearts were gripped. And then he made this statement. He said, none of us have ever been able to go there. It's just not safe. You can't, you can't get there. And you stepped forward after and you said, well, we'll go. 
And you reached out to this other awesome couple, yeah. amazing couple. Uh, they reached out to me and Jill. Um, and you put All together, true. True. you put together the A team. Humility is my spiritual yeah. gift. Um, you put together the A team, the Ammons and Aruda team, mm -hmm. and we got to watch at that time. You not be the the liaisons to Haiti. Um, we got to watch you really full fledged. Jill and I walk as our missions pastors. Mm -hmm. We went halfway around the world in the craziest of conditions. And continually the faith and the vision of Mickey and Aaron said, hey, where we're going is good. Jesus has got us. It's all going to be okay. Um, we got to go to the place where we gave crusades and villages, watching people firmly know their new identity, step into it. Mm -hmm. We got to pray every kind of that. I'll never forget Aaron praying for a, a woman um, who was, was blind and we were leaving by boat and literally she's leaning over the dock saying, please, please, please. And, there's, and Aaron just reached out her hand to pray for her. Uh, for her, just the hunger that we saw there. We got to train up their pastors. We got to stand in a place to teach them what it would look like to lead in business. And we got to visit 13 villages of the Egbema Kingdom, speaking life, mm -hmm. praying, blessing, watching God break assignments like, like the place where he broke a spirit of death and sent it off the land. I mean, just crazy stuff that we got to watch. And you're not done. You came back and, and one of the things that we heard from these villages was they believe Christ in them is the hope of glory. They're not asking for a handout. In fact, what they want is, is a hand up, right, to say, help us walk with you. We want to know the glory in us, and we actually want to lead in industry where we're at. Mm -hmm. And so right now, you guys are on the foundational floor, just like you did for Haiti, helping build what sponsorships could look like for us to sponsor those tribes. And God is going to do it. Yes. He's going to do it through us. We're going to see it in 2021 yes. and moving forward. So you came back. Now you're leading Haiti, and you're leading Nigeria. Um, when you came back in the midst of all that, there was, uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch, I was having some, some trouble as our uh, teaching pastor and kind of lead for the vision of our church, because one of the things we heard for many years was about our communication. So if you were ever somebody that bemoaned, if you've been here a long time and you've ever been like, oh my gosh, why don't they communicate with us? We'd have some people that would be in 12 meetings and knew 12 different ways everything that was happening at the church, and then other people would hear it announced here, and they'd be a leader of the church, and they're like, oh, we're going there, I guess. And so that's one of the things about being a family. And I reached out to Mickey and Aaron and I said, we need help. And I've watched you as leaders and you said, we'll do it. And so you walked with me and then at that, at that point, really God gave you a vision to birth a digital outreach team that built our website, that built a social media presence, that established email communication, that did all of our series graphics that came together. And suddenly we found in the last two years, and I want to celebrate this, because listen, if you've been around Overflow for any length of time, I came here in 2002, um, it was years and years and years and years. The thing we'd constantly hear is just, we love you, but the communication is just not clear. Christ in you has turned something that was a weakness into a strength. And we're walking in a place. And we couldn't have known it in 2018 and 19 when they stepped up to say yes. We couldn't have known 2020 was coming. But the, the work that you planted into the digital outreach team carried us through the pandemic as we couldn't be face-to-face for months, and really has opened up what it could look like to actually go as a missional church moving forward, which is awesome. But you weren't done. So then when we moved, we said, we want to be a missional church. We're not doing small groups. I'm telling you, you're going to get tired <laughs> thinking about it. We said, we need missional community leaders. You said, we'll do it. So you started leading a missional community to, to married couples, newly married couples, building foundations, raising up leaders. Then, Aaron, it wasn't enough for just one. You and Ruthie started one for the ladies, Coffee and Jesus, and you started a missional community that just poured out leaders. And both of them were so blessed that they got to the place they needed to multiply, and they were bigger than what we had originally seen. As I've watched this, um, beyond that place, you know, Aaron has come as a voice within our church, as a teacher, um, as a preacher, as an author, if you don't know, Aaron has written a book, Unadulterated. If you haven't read it, go to Amazon right now and buy it. It is amazing. Um, and Mickey, you've come in the place that though, between you and Aaron, Aaron will um, use most of the words in conversation. Um, Mickey, you have such a rare blend that I've watched in, in just walking with you as your friend and co-pastor, that you walk with a bold vision, a deep humility, and this uncanny ability to just cut through the noise and move us to where we need to do. Like, and you, you work in such an economy of words. You don't say a lot, but when you speak, it matters. And we listen. Um, so the last part of this thing that came more recently, as Pastor Ken, as outreach pastor, before you guys stepped into the role, had prayed for years and years and years. We had seen all these things happen in Haiti. We had seen support go to Nigeria. But he had been praying that God would, in our own backyard, 
Show us how to live a missional life. Show us how to carry the gospel mm -hmm. to Brandon, the Bay, beyond. And we tried a lot of things, but nothing took root. And you stepped in, and God started speaking to you about mission partnerships. And we started finding places where some we were already supporting, but it was just financial support. And we found this sense of heart support with places like Choices and the Door of Hope and Family Promise. And before we knew it, there were all these places where we were walking as the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. And God started speaking to us as a church to say, you know, we need to do that through missional community. We need to understand more of the missional part. And you've just been such a voice walking in. So I guess my first question with all of that, that's, that's where you've walked in the last six years at our church. When the heck do you guys sleep? That's my question. Um, because the, the, your yes has elevated. And I don't know if anybody else in the room can feel it, but I have been so blessed by your yes. Where you've walked, I receive you as our missions and outreach pastors, as our elders. And, and where you have moved us to this point, I'm just so excited because the Spirit of the Lord has been speaking to you about what comes next. Mm -hmm. And I'm ready, and we're ready to receive it. Mm -hmm. And so I've got some questions I want to ask this morning. All right. As I've heard you guys going, um, a lot in conversation, there are these words, and especially Aaron, I've heard from you, these two words that have come up, incarnational and missional. That, that we need to live in community, but we need to live in a way that if we're going to really carry the gospel, if we're really going to affect change, if we're really going to be the church. Mm -hmm. We've been saying for a long time, the church is not the service here, the church is the body. But that we've got to be an incarnational people, and we've got to be a missional people. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, and that was a lot. Thank you. I do feel tired a little bit. <laughs> Um, but I think if we're going into kindergarten, maybe I'll get a nap. That's good. Right? Nap time is okay. coming. Yeah. So, Surprise. Um, yeah, but I will say that it, we came here thinking we would just be members. Or, but this, the beauty of this church is that you're not meant to hide. Um, we want to bring out what um, is God's glory in you. So that, because diversity is, uh, is the, the beauty of um, the gospel and the church and what it's supposed to look like. And so um, we would spend many weeks in our car, our kids excited and ready to go back, and we'd just kind of be crying. We're like, why are we crying? Like, we come to this church and we cry. What is going on? And, of course, the Lord was molding our hearts to understand um, the glory that we were meant to release here yeah. um, that's different, but it's also complementary. So all that we've sort of done here has been... Um, started at tables like these with you and Pastor Len and Pastor Chris and many of you. Um, we just sit around together and go, what is the Lord doing? And then he whispers in each of our ears and we are able to confirm where he's taking us so that it's, it's a plurality of his voice through us. Um, so when we talk about incarnational and missional um, community and being together, um, I think about this story uh, when we were younger, in our younger years, and we slept more and had time for lots of working out and, you know, beautiful bodies that would make children <laughs> eventually, we decided to sign up for this 5K, and, and it, it would be no problem, you know, we were, we were uh, set to go, and I'm just going to have a good time on a Saturday morning. Um, and so we get up there, and suddenly my body is not feeling the way it did the week before and I'm uh you know any of that and so instead of I'm just having a rough day or whatever and instead of Mickey kind of going and plowing ahead of me um don't look it up on Google because I don't think it's there anymore <laughs> but this guy came in last place in his age group <laughs> because he stayed with me the whole time um, he let his reputation go, and he just said, I'm just going to stay with you. It's okay. It's not a big deal. I'm just going to run and stay in your pace, whatever that is. And I was like, okay. Um, and I was ready to quit and give up. And that, to me, is what incarnational is. I'm going to stay with you, um, whether you're suffering, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, whether you're really motivated and you're trucking along and having the best race ever, or, or whether you're just, wow. you're, you're toughing it out. And missionally though um, is to say not just I'm going to stay with you in your suffering but I want you to be restored I want the fullness of who you are um, in Christ to be made known and to be seen because I I know who you really are and so as we kind of were plodding along and I was feeling discouraged he was offering encouragement and he was saying you can do this you've got this I know who you are and do you remember what happened this week and so of course that week um, he was reminding me that I had suffered a miscarriage. 
And in my going, I thought, I'll just plow through this. I'll just forget. It's not that big of a deal, right? We'll just keep running the race. And, um, and he caused me to stop and to think through, what are you really experiencing um, to bring restoration, to give some grace um, to show mercy and love. And so that's what missional is. It's, I'm going to bring you back to restoration through the name of Jesus Christ to who you truly are because you're meant to keep running. You're supposed to keep running. So the, the marriage of those two things is really what um, the church is meant to be. That's so good. And can you see the difference between those as you hear them talk? Between being incarnational and missional and the reason they're so needed. In fact, for many years, there, there are many churches, the church I grew up in, was missional in a sense, but not incarnational. Meaning, they'd give you the gospel tracts, they'd give you all about how to tell people how to follow Jesus, but it was devoid of relationship. So you were going all the time just to these strangers and going, here's the Romans road, here's this, and you wondered why it didn't bear fruit. Because you've been called to actually love your neighbor as yourself, to walk with them, to be with them. And then I spent some time in the church where relationship was, was huge. This is a church where relationship is huge. We find that we'd get with people and we'd weep with those who weep and we'd grieve with those who grieve. we rejoice with those who re- rejoice. But then they would get stuck and not know where to go. And if you don't understand how to share Christ in you, the hope of glory, how to share a reason for the hope you have, then we're together but we're not actually leading them to where they need to go. So we need this, this marriage of incarnational and missional. And your missional community has been walking through this. And as you've tried to walk, I know you guys, um, Josh and Brenda Baylog, well, one of the phrases I've heard from the four of you collectively is this phrase, gospel fluency. Mm-hmm. And you've been bringing this gospel fluency to your missional community. Can you explain how gospel fluency is really bringing that marriage of incarnational and missional together, what that looks like? Thank you, yes. Um, so Psalm 107 two says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So gospel fluency is just speaking the gospel and the gospel story into your everyday things of life, your encounters as you go, um, through life. Many, many Christians have either a fear or uneasiness about sharing the gospel. And, um, in the book, the author gives, Um, these five examples, and I'm just going to read them and see if any of these kind of ring a bell to you. They do to me. I'm not perfect. And these, (laughs) yes, I'm sorry. It's that one race you lost. That's That's what it was. Other than that. That's right. All right. So five common reasons identified that cause us to hesitate to share the gospel. Number one, We are in a spiritual battle, so the enemy of our souls tries everything possible to keep us from speaking about Jesus. Now, we have a restoration manual here that can cut through that really fast, just like Chuck said. He's already, uh, Jesus already beat that um, that battle for us. Uh, Number two, many of us love what people think of us more than what we, how, more than we love people. So in our fear of rejection, we keep our mouths shut. Uh, number three, most Christians have never tried to share the, their um, gospel hope and therefore have never experienced the Spirit of God giving them the words at that moment of uh, boldness and the words to say. Um, number four, many Christians just don't know the gospel very well, or if they do, don't practice sharing it with other believers very often, right? You're, you get better at, at what you practice. Yeah. Um, and number five, most, most Christians don't really believe that their neighbors, their friends, their family members um, will spend eternity apart from God if they don't have faith in Jesus. Judgment is coming and hell is real. And apart from faith in Jesus Christ, people will, will miss out on enjoying life with God forever. And so uh, if one of those five or all of those five um, <laughs> ring true to you, we have some, this, this great book helps us walk through those. And so whenever you're in a missional community, the idea is that the missional community is going to set you up and support you to have encounters with people who don't know Jesus. I mean, that is the mission. Every mission of a missional community is to share the gospel message to somebody who doesn't know. And so after spending some time um, with our missional community, we knew that their heart was right. They were ready to, they were ready to jump in. They're ready to, to um, help, to, to uh, build things, to give wherever. But the part that was missing is um, this gospel fluency, the language of, okay, now that I, now that I found somebody, what do I say so that it's 
not awkward so that it doesn't instantly turn them off and um, you know we don't want to be outside on, on the corner holding a sign that said you know everybody's going to hell or or else you know you better you better find Jesus right now that, that um, so how do you in a relationship with somebody you know how do you share it in a, in a way that that works and so that's kind of what we're working through we ha we're um, uh, a few weeks in it's about eight to ten weeks and so it's taken a little bit of time to get our momentum going um, but we're working through that it's right here it's easy it's easy to follow and so if you're thinking about starting a group and, and you're just like ah, I don't, what am I gonna do the first week we have the plan it's easy to follow that's awesome Does that makes sense does, does anybody in the room want to love people your, your life to be marked by loving people and spending a relationship with people anybody in the room want to know how to carry Jesus and not make it awkward and be very effective <laughs> you carrying the hope of the world listen that doesn't happen from here here we're going to give you words of exhortation we're going to give you words of revelation it happens in community just like anything else, right? You wouldn't learn how to play football by a coach just standing up and explaining the game to you. You've got to get out. You've got to put the pads on. You've got to join a team. And you've got to get in the dirt and stay there together until you develop those skills. That's what our missional communities are doing. That's why we make such a big deal about the missional community being the church. And this activation, Sunday mornings, is our pep rally. It's our time to celebrate together and be a body. It's our time to hear the bigger vision. But missional communities where you're equipped toward that sense of gospel fluency, that's where we're going. And so in that... In your voice as our missions and outreach pastors, as our elders, um, one of the values we hold up here is expectancy. That we don't always know what God's doing, but we're expectant that He is good and that He's for our good and He's going to do something greater than we could ask or imagine. You agree with that? Mm -hmm. Right? God is up to more than we could ask or imagine right now. He's on the throne and He's got something great for us. So when we listen, He starts to reveal previews of coming attractions. Yeah. And so when we're speaking missionally, it would make sense that God would reveal many of those previews of coming attractions to our missions and outreach pastors, and he's been speaking to you about where God is taking us. And you have this phrase that you've been hearing, ready, get set, go. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that for this season? Yeah, we, um, we know that sometimes the race uh, seems a little, a little difficult, but Paul talks about uh, the race in Philippians. Um, and so just from that language, we sort of pulled from there. Um, we were sent here to run a race. So what is the race, Mickey? The race is to get the biggest house before you die. Nope. The race is to get the most Instagram followers. No. The race <laughs> is to get the most money in your bank account. No. I, 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 I do remember <laughs> one more. This is how I look good in my Speedo. Yeah. I'm out of here. <laughs> That's it. Oh. <laughs> no. No. Um, so those are all good things. That is not the race he's called those us not to. All good Praise things. the Lord. <laughs> Bathing suits are made to have legs, gentlemen. You're not European. Continue. <laughs> no, Paul says, and you can echo Paul's words because he said um, it's all garbage. It's all garbage. <laughs> he said all those other things are garbage. Um, <laughs> but he's speaking to growing and maturing believers, which is why we could kind of laugh about this. Because we're in a room, our, our church is, um, is filled with people who are growing and maturing, and that's the goal and the, and the desire of their heart is to grow in their faith. Um, and so Philippians 3.13, Paul talks about this and addressing a, a group of growing and mature believers, not non-believers. He's saying this to believers. He says, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute, absolute fullness that I'm pursuing. So he's saying, I haven't arrived anywhere yet. He's, he's bringing himself incarnationally among them and saying, I'm with you guys. I know this is not an easy race. He says, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. He says, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. And I think this is key for us. So, so often when we think about being ready, we want to be prepared. We want to go through this whole book before we step out. We want to have all the answers and be strengthened. And he's saying, that's not it. We don't depend on that. Isaiah 58 says, when you spend yourselves on behalf of the poor, that is when your frame is strengthened. That is when you're like a well-watered garden. So the, these are important truths that we have to say because we'll flip it. We'll get it backwards, and we'll want to be the well-watered garden and then produce fruit. And he says, no, you plant, and you grow, and then all of those things happen. The rain comes. So he says, 
However, I do one, have one compelling focus. I forget all the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead, which is a hope that endures. So when we think about this race, there's this guy named John Aquari who was a ta uh, from Tanzania. He was a marathon runner. In 1968, he goes to the Olympics in Mexico City. Um, and he had been training, and he was a good runner. He wasn't set to win or anything, um, they didn't think. But, but he goes, and he sets out, and he runs the race. What I love about the picture of a marathon runner is when you have, like, a sprint, you know, you're, you're putting your feet in the blocks, you're, you're kind of readying yourself. But if you've been to, like, a, any kind of um, ra long-distance race, you just kind of stand there <laughs> until the gun goes off, and sometimes you can't even see it, and you just start plodding along, right, with everybody else. You're like, I'm in this race, here we go, and then it, it sort of, you know, everybody gets some separation, you get some room to breathe, but so, so John um, Aquari is standing there, um, getting ready to run his race, and off he goes with the, the other runners, and at some point in the race, um, he starts getting really dehydrated. He hadn't trained for this altitude. Um, it was not what he expected. And uh, he, he gets a cramp, a really severe cramp, and in the midst of all these other runners, as they're going pretty quickly, um, he falls and crashes and smashes his shoulder, bangs himself all up, dislocates his knee, and so he's pulled off to the side to get some medical attention to rehydrate and all this. And all the other runners that were in that, they quit. They stop. And everybody expected him to do so as well because he was one of the worst um, affected. But he gets back into the race, and he ends up dead last. And when I mean dead last, he was dead last. An hour after the last person had come in, here comes John Aquari with all of his bandages, coming off and blowing in the breeze, and he finishes the race. To 3,000 fans who stayed around because finishing a race in the middle of being defeated is not a common thing to see. And so they stayed to celebrate him hours after the first winner had been celebrated. Um, as we think about John Aquari, the reporter came after and said, why, you know, why'd you Why'd you do this? Why'd you keep going? Nobody would have been upset had you quit. And he has this um, most famous quote. He says, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. And so you and I have been sent here to finish the race in the midst of all of the stuff that we're experiencing, falling down, smashing all over the place, being a part of the crowd and suddenly not, each of us has a decision to make. Wow. Am I going to finish this race? And when Paul talks about it, he says, I run straight for the divine invitation because it's not that we're running to win. It has already been won. But Jesus is standing at the end of the line and going, I'm your prize. Keep going. You don't want to miss the end and that um, um, time with me. You don't want to miss it. Keep running. Finish this race and finish strong. And so he says, I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all who are fully mature, that could be you and me. But if it's not, Paul doesn't let us off the hook. He says, so let all who are fully mature have the same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, so even if you don't feel like you're fully mature, even if you're not there yet, he's saying, even if you don't feel ready, keep going. God will reveal it to them. He keeps writing. He's like, don't worry, you're in this too. You don't feel ready, that's okay. You are ready, and let us all advance together to reach this victory prize following one path with one passion. So there is a path, um, and we're going to trust that God will reveal it to us. It is the gospel, and it's seeing God's chosen people know who they are in Christ. So whether they've ever heard his name or not, or they've heard it and they just haven't known the value of being restored, um, he's saying keep going. That's your path, and that's your passion, and that's your purpose. And I promise all the other things... Um, will find their appropriate place in light of that truth, in the light of the purpose that you were called to. Um, so that is where he's saying, you don't, you're not supposed to feel ready, but I'm giving you a command. It's not ready, question mark. Ready? Are you ready? That's not what he's saying. He says, ready. 
ready is what you are, ready, because I am capable and I am able and it's not about you. Wow. So it's that point of he makes us ready. He has won the race. He is the prize. Yes. And the word he's speaking to the church now is get set. set. It, it's, we're, we're ready to go somewhere. And so you guys have been spending some time helping us get set. Because uh, is anybody at the place where you're like, yeah, I'm in. Now, practically, show me where to go. I'm ready. Let's run. Is anybody with me? Um, and so where, where Mickey and Aaron have been walking as our uh, outreach pastors, along with the digital outreach team, is putting some language to how our missional communities can start to do this together. We don't do it alone. We don't do it just by exhortation. We do it in community. But how do we actually go there and see some of the things like the missional communities we celebrated last week? And you've got these mission partnerships that you're going to share yes. with the body now. Lights yes. are on. Here we Lights go. Lights are on. Uh-oh. We, uh, we, as in not me, but the digital outreach team, <laughs> has put together these great missional partnership guides. And so I'm going to use the microphone, and I'm uh, Chris <laughs> is going to pass them out, and Jeff is passing them out. Let's just um, do one per family. So raise your hand if you need one. One per family. They're coming around now. And inside you're going to find... Some pretty amazing information in here. Thanks to Phil, and Thanks to Phil Lowe, Courtney, and Mary Angel, and Caitlin. Caitlin. Just one more You're second. You're doing good, Pastor there. Chris and Jeff. Keep running the race. Keep running the race. Go, go. go. You got this. Don't grow weary. <laughs> Don't fall. God didn't no call you to start the race. He called you to finish it. <laughs> finish it. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Don't get anybody a paper cut while you're going. Awesome. Does right. anybody else still need, you or your family need one? Just lift up your hand so we can get it to you. Awesome. Go for it, Pastor Mickey. All right. So on the first page is a map of the world. And on the second page, <laughs> on the second page, we have um, the over, overflow partnership vision. So you guys can read that. I wanted to highlight uh, paragraph number three. Our two international outreach partnerships are strategically considered a church-wide effort. So this is Haiti and Nigeria. Uh, we believe that collect collectively we can have better eyes on the ongoing needs here. So for this reason, our elders will act as ambassadors, um, led by myself and Aaron. So I'll be um, the ambassador for Haiti, and Aaron is the ambassador for Nigeria. And then as you continue... Um, Page uh, three here has Haiti and Nigeria. It just shares a little tidbit about um, kind of the, what, um, how we support them, the missions they're doing there. And then if you go to this page, you'll see each missional um, partnership broken down and highlighted. Um, so you have Adore Hope, which we heard about last week, Choices, LL Ministries. And over the next few weeks, you're going to hear more in depth on these, so I won't spend um, too, mu too much time. But for example, we'll do um, Family Promise. So Family Promise, the mission is, our mission is to help homeless and low-income families achieve sustainable independence through a community-based response. We initiate coordinated local efforts that bring communities together to help homeless families regain their housing, their independence, and their dignity. So this is a huge program. Uh, uh, last year, uh, they served more than 125,000 um, family members throughout the whole country. Um, and if you look at, at, at the bottom there, it says, for more information, contact our ambassador, Julie Thomas. Now, if you turn to the back, you'll see that the missional community groups have colors in them, and they are color-coded to match what's on this page. So what color is this? Yellow or orange? <laughs> so you have gold. You have the gold here the matches the gold here. Now, this is a, um, a working document that we hope is going to, and we pray that it's going to expand and grow larger. Um, and so as it does, it's going to be easier to, to find. So let's say um, as you're praying and choices is on your heart, you're going to know who the uh, liaison is here and what groups match um, what you're looking for. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So what's key here is as we grow, um, you might find that you have a real heart for justice. So all of these matter to you and that's good. They all should matter. Um, but 
we want you to find one that matters most as you gather with your missional community because this is going to give you the one passion and one purpose together that as you meet in your missional community this is the stuff that you're talking about you're talking about in the thomas group homelessness and those experiencing homelessness and their eyes are keen and their senses are aware of those who are experiencing homelessness and we saw this um, activated a couple of weeks ago because julie thomas is our ambassador we look to her and say, above everyone else here, we see that she has, God has called her into that role to speak and advocate on um, homelessness. And she's a voice for her group to us. So that way there's not a hundred people going, this is important, because it's all important, right? Um, but it allows us to be strategic as we go deeper and wider, um, that we would, we would know who these voices are that God has called. So she's advocating for those who are experiencing homelessness. So just a couple weeks ago, she called and she, uh, in her job as a social worker, she knew of somebody who was having a hard time getting placed in a center. Um, they were leaving an abusive relationship with children. And so they were trying to place this person. Um, and they, they weren't going to have a center, a place av available for, um, you know, a week or so. And so she came up to the church, this woman, and Pastor Chris and I were able to pray for her. But I'm listening very intentionally of, by, about what Julie is saying because she knows and she's living it and she's praying for it and she's advocating for it. And so she's that voice. Um, and I trust her. And so as we prayed for this woman, um, Overflow Church was able to provide a week of um, just some interim hotel stay for her family so that they wouldn't be living in their car. Um, and those are just some, some big and small things that as a church we're doing um, to make sure that the needs in our community are, are met there. But it's a, it's a beautiful picture if you look at it, because if I could just steal these two resources for a oh, second. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So the, the gospel fluency piece that Pastor Mickey was talking about, when you come in your missional community, this is where you're equipping one another with your friends, your family, your neighbors, every person you encounter everywhere you go to carry the gospel. Okay, that's part of carrying the gospel. That's awesome. But when we come together like this, this is when collectively we do something that, that is so much greater than the sum of the parts. It's where we come under one umbrella together as a missional community and say, we're going to do something really great. And so... Um, Again, just as we shared, I can't remember if I shared this, this service or not. Do we share about the Door of Hope yet? Oh, yeah. Is that yeah. The service? Do it again. I'm going to share it again. Act like you haven't heard this, all right? <laughs> so just last week, <laughs> what? the Lambert family hosted with the Door of Hope. Um, we, had, we had the Arutas missional community and the Lambert missional community that had been the front lines for uh, fostering and, and for orphan care. And so we saw all those beautiful testimonies last week from that. But the Lamberts, because of their yes, they st stood in and our missional community came around them and walked with them. And because of that, yes, we're walking incarnationally to, to Josh and Courtney's neighbors and to everywhere they go and at their workplace. But in addition to that, we're walking in a mission. And last week, we raised $14,000 yeah. as a church. So I want you to understand when we talk missional communities, it's all of that. We are redefining what it means to belong to the church. Sunday morning, either coming online through our Facebook Live or coming here, is super important so that we walk together and we celebrate and we walk in relationship as a family and we hear the vision of where the Lord's leading us. But that's not the end all of the church. And when you come to missional community, I don't want you to just hear small group friendship. Yes, it's going to be a small group and they will be friends, but this is the place where you're going to be equipped to what you just raised your hand and said, I really want. I want to know how to naturally carry Jesus everywhere I go. I want to see the cross at the center of everything I do. And to walk in a place where we actually start to change brand in the Bay and beyond. And we do all of that through our missional community. So this is a huge resource. Um, we need more missional communities. Some of you are in a missional community, and this will help give some language to where you can find what that mission would be that you could come around. We're going to give you an option in just a minute, an opportunity to be able just to respond to that. Before we do... You are our missions and outreach pastors, and you are elders of our church, and we are ready to hear um, what the Lord is speaking to you. Is there anything else that you feel is a charge that God is saying, now's the time for you to go? Yes. So we have, um, in our own missional community, we've been walking this out for um, about a year ago. It was when we, we sort of saw the, the Lord saying, it's time to go, it's time, it's time to move. And I remember sharing with a couple of um, people who were in our, our group, Coffee and Jesus, who really loved it, and they wanted to stay. 
and um, we had to say, we're going to go this way, and we really want you to come, and it was a lot of language, a lot of conversations, a lot of, we're with you, we want to stay with you, um, let's walk together, and it was just last week in our group that um, one of them said, you know, I, I had a hard time wanting to move to where you were telling us to go, but I see now that it's better, Come on. that what, 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 what it was, what we thought was right for a time, that, that small group environment wasn't quite living the purpose and the calling the Lord has given us, which is to go missionally together, to rally around together in the same um, common goal and passion to see God's news be spread. That's what he gave us the charge to do. That's the great commission. Um, so it, when we look at this, we pray and we see this growing um, exponentially as the Lord lays things on their heart. And all of these um, community groups have one, um, have a missional partnership. Everybody has one. So we've strategically designed this series together so that all of us have some time to pray and consider what is the Lord calling our group to do and what is God saying how to get into a group? How am I supposed to do that? What am I to do? Um, and so the purpose is to pick one to choose to go, to put your feet to faith, to respond in willingness and say, I'm a, I want to be a part of what God is doing um, right now here through Overflow Church. I want in on this. Um, and so that's a big key partnership, um, I guess. But, but I wanted to frame it in um, this passage in Romans. In Romans here. Um, and I just want to slow down with this part. Because we've decided as a church recently that we want to not just be in missional community, uh, walk in this way, but as a church in our building, when we started answering the question, if we shut our doors, would the community miss us? What makes us different than a civic group? And it was those two questions of incarnational and missional. Those were the answers. And so as a church, we decided over the summer that what we have we were going to give and use wherever it was, and even in its imperfection, even with the pink chairs, <laughs> we're saying, come in, we're here. And we wanted to respond to the needs of our community as a church. And so we opened our doors to two Fishhawk, uh, two Fishhawk Classical Conversations groups. Um, we opened the doors to I-9. We opened our doors to the Heat for their programs. We opened the doors to the, for the Dance Center. Um, we opened our doors in places where the doors were closed because of COVID. And we said, we're going to do it, Lord, and we're going to trust you through it. And he has been faithful yes, has. to us um, and to our, to our people. So what we want to say uh, as we decide to do that in Romans 10, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, will be rescued and experience new life. And we have experienced that. Then Paul asked this question, these few questions that I want to slow down for. But how can people call on him for help if they have not yet believed? And how can they believe in one they have not yet heard of? And how can they hear the message of life if there is no one there to proclaim it? And often that passage is um, interpreted with the word preach, but it's simply to proclaim. Yep. It is simply to proclaim, and all of us are called to that. It's not just a, a preacher up here at the pulpit like Pastor Chuck. It is your voice that's meant to proclaim it. And how can that message be proclaimed if messengers have yet to be sent? So that's why the scriptures say, how welcome is the arrival of those proclaiming the joyful news of peace and of good things to come. There is a good news gospel that we are meant to proclaim. And I remember last year, because some of you guys might feel a little like, I, try, I just had Thanksgiving with my family. They didn't want to hear anything I had to say about Jesus. <laughs> and one of the wonder, most wonderful moments last year in Nigeria, we were going through these crusades and we would hand out the, we were doing this um, object lesson where the shirt was all messy. And then a new shirt, a clean shirt was given um, to show that how the gospel makes us new. And then an extra shirt was given. Because to the person who's made new, there's another one that you're meant to give away in the name of Jesus. And so Pastor Wilson gets a hold of this white shirt and in just like the, the most amazing thing, he's like, yes. And he's all excited and he's moving around. He was like, you have the shirt 
and you want to give it to somebody and you're trying to give it to the shirt, they don't want the shirt, you go to the next person. And he just goes on and on and on. And he says, they don't want the shirt. There's another person waiting that the Lord has called you to say, go give the shirt to that person. Um, And so as we move, the, the series, the whole point of this is to give away the shirts that have been given so graciously to us. Mm. Um, and so as we, we do that this week on the 6th to the 12th, very practically family promise, we haven't been able to host them in the church because of COVID. So we are going to once again, host them by delivering meals. If you would like to be a part of that, um, maybe you're not in the Thomas missional community, but you're like, ah, I can start there. We'll get you on that list to sign up to provide meals for that week because it's still our hosting week as a church. Um, additionally, during that time in Nigeria, um, for when Pastor Wilson passed in April, we didn't come to the church and say we'd really like to provide money for funeral costs or we'd like to just give some encouragement to them because they're really suffering and um, and that has been a severe time of suffering for, for them. Um, in the midst of COVID and and losing their lead pastor. And Pastor Praise has stepped up to lead um, in that role. Praise God. So we are coming to you now in this season. And there'll be three opportunities. If you would like to give and contribute right now, um, today, we we won't stop you from that. (laughs) But we're also going to um, take up an offering in uh, during center event on the 12th the women's event, um, during the men's rise event on the 9th, and during the Christmas Eve service. Our goal is $3,000 to provide rice to the villages, um, to provide um, some Christmas presents for the pastors and their families, um, and to meet the needs of uh, Pastor Praise and her family as she's been suffering this year um, through that loss. So uh, lastly is next week in the What Can I Give? All About the Orphans. Um, program, Pastor Lucian will be here. So those are three strategic ways there. That's awesome. To go. Pastor Mickey and Aaron, um, our family is transformed by your yes. Both my family and our family. Can we just show the Lord how much we love Pastor Aaron and Mickey? Give it up for them. And I'm going to ask if you would stand with me. We want to take these last few minutes and now really activate what we talked about. So I'm going to ask Pastor Aaron and Mickey, if they can come up front. Pastor Chris, if you can come up front. And we've just heard a charge from our missions and outreach pastors of what the Lord is saying, that He has made us ready, that it's time to get set because we have somewhere to go, and that we're to go there in community. And so I just simply want to ask this. Our agreement is powerful. Will you receive and agree with the word that your missions and outreach pastors have just given you? If you do, say, I'll go. Just say, I'll go. I'll go. I'm so excited you said that because our agreement changes things. So in that this morning, I want to ask if you'd close your eyes for just a minute. If you're in Christ, you've been made new. You've been given, as as Aaron said, that new shirt. It can't be taken from you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he invites you now to carry the life-giving gospel. But it's not just for you. We go there in community. With God, we grow together and we go together. And so I want to ask you right now, I understand Thanksgiving has just come. I understand we're getting to the end of the year. I understand your schedule might be crazy. But God has called for us to live nothing less than fully in community with one another. As we prepare for all the places we're going to go in 2021, I want to ask right now, If you're not a part of a missional community and God is speaking to you and saying, I need to be in one of those. I need to be in a community of people that are going to help me be equipped in gospel fluency to know how Christ flows out of me, to know what my faith looks like, to know how to carry Christ naturally to my family, my friends, my co-workers. But also, I want to be a part of something so much bigger than me. I want to join with them to see Brandon in the Bay and beyond transformed. And I've been making excuses. Maybe I've been saying I'm an introvert. Maybe I've been saying I'm too busy. I don't have all the answers. I don't know. But I need to be a part of a missional community. If that's you, Pastor Chris is right up front. And I'm going to ask you right now, just even as I'm talking, to step out from your seat and go to him so that you would take the next step to join a missional community. 
Maybe you're at the place where you're in a missional community. And you're going and you love the family where you're together, but things are starting to stir about how you could be equipped to be incarnational, how you could be equipped to be missional, where you can go together. Maybe you're at the place where one of these missions that we talked about today, something's starting to spark you and you want to know practically what's the next step I can take. Pastor Mickey and Pastor Aaron are right up front here and I'm going to ask you in just a minute to come to them if you have a question of where it is you need to go next. For some of you, I've mentioned it, God is saying the time is coming where we will need to start new missional communities. Even these mission partnerships we have, we're just scratching the surface of all the places God's going to take us in the next years. Maybe you're in a missional community and you really love the family together and you're saying what Aaron's group was saying to her last year, but we just want to stay here. We just like this. It's just comfortable. But listen, I'm going to tell you, some of our missional communities, you're super groups. Your group's filled with leaders and the harvest is plentiful. And maybe God's stirring your heart right now to say, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what it looks like, but I've been called to be a leader in the kingdom. And so I'm going to step out and take the next step as what it would mean for me to be a missional community leader. I'm going to ask right now, before we move on, I have one more charge for us this morning, but before we move on, if God's calling you to join or start a missional community, I'm going to ask you to go to Pastor Chris. If God's calling you right now where a mission is stirring your heart or you're in a missional community and you want to know how to be more equipped to walk out missionally, I'm going to ask you to step out right now to Mickey and Aaron. Would you take just a second and do that and then I'm going to give you one last charge. If that's you, go ahead and step out. just a minute. God's saying to you, it's it's too long of saying that you're too busy, this is too good to miss. You need to go ahead and take that step. We could wait to the end of the service, we could say you could go, but then you'll be rushing out to the next step you need to go and we'll be here next week again and it's time. If God's telling you to take the next step, I want you to just step out and do that now. While they do that, there's this last challenge I want to give. For every person in the room, I want to challenge you right now. 2020 has been a hard year. Would you just right now breathe? Just breathe. Would you live this season? Jesus didn't just come so that you would get by, so that you would survive, so that you'd be okay. No, if you're in Christ, you were co-crucified with Christ. The old you is gone. Is there a place where there's shame or guilt or weight and it needs to leave you because Christ already took it from you. He already cut it away from you. And you need to just breathe this morning and remind yourself, I'm not who I used to be. I'm not under guilt or shame or condemnation. Right now with every eye closed, I feel like there's somebody in the room that you're you're wrestling against some lie of what you felt you were. It's like this weight and burden on your shoulders. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I command right now that Christ in you would speak from, from the inside, internally, and lift that burden off of your shoulders. That every lie of shame, that every confusion of the enemy that's come over you, that every place you feel like you're running on a treadmill to to try to figure it out, that it would be broken now in Jesus' name. That he would come down with fresh revelation of his love and his adoration over you. That where you've been striving to become enough to figure it out, to do it right, that it would be broken. And you'd be granted the grace to step into the effortless gospel. Would you just breathe this morning? 2020 has been a heavy year, a weighty year, a year of much substance, but it compares nothing at all to the substance of Christ in you. Jesus, right now, I bless my friends. I thank you for where they've crossed the line. So many to say, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And I pray right now that they would not grow weary in doing good because at the right time you've promised we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. I ask right now for enlightened eyes of expectancy all through this room. 
that we would see and remember who we are, whose we are, and where we are in the story. We're on offense, not on defense. We're advancing the ball down the field. We're seeing captives set free. We're pushing against the gates of hell. That every place the gates of hell have set up camp to release death, we're going to come and release life. We're going to reverse death and release life. So I ask right now, if you've been tired, if you've been weary, would you just put yourself in a position here in the next 30 seconds, just receive. I ask Holy Spirit, revive, restore, renew. I ask that a wave of the Father's adoration would come over you. That you would know on a level too deep for words, that in all of your mess and in all this stuff you haven't figured out yet, that He just adores you. The maker of everything you've ever experienced knows you by name and He adores you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And right now, He is standing with you. So I bless you to walk renewed and in confidence to carry the life-giving gospel. If you agree with that, say amen. This morning before we leave, there's just one more thing for us to do. While we've been here, our lead pastor, Pastor Lynn, and his wife, Robin, uh, elders of our church and lead pastor of our church, are at Radiant Church this morning. And the reason they're there is we believe with all of our heart there's only one church in the Tampa Bay area. It just meets in a lot of different buildings. So the other churches, we never look at another church as our competition. We look at them as our brothers and our sisters. And so Pastor Lynn and Robin have gone to bring them words of encouragement, to come around them, to pour into them. And so right now, I have no idea what direction Radiant Church is in. I'm very directionally challenged. But if you lift your hands up, we're just going to bless Radiant Church, Pastor Lynn and them. And so, Father, I just thank you right now for Radiant Church. I thank you for Pastor June and his family and the ways they're standing with big glory and big dreams. I ask right now that you would give them more than they could ask or imagine. I ask that you would elevate their, their capacity to dream. I ask that you'd bring unity among their staff and their leadership and their lay leadership. I ask that places that there's drama and division and lies and things that are just pulling them down, that it be broken. I ask that the dreams that they have, that you'd give them new expectancy to say, I see you and I'm advancing it. And Lord, we, Overflow Church, we bless Radiant Church. We look at your dreams and we say, yes, run, run, run. I ask as Pastor Lynn and Robin stand before them that you would release words of wisdom both for Radiant Church and for Overflow Church. And I thank you so much, Lord, for our lead pastor, for a pastor with a heart for the city. Thank you for what he's doing. I pray that you'd renew him and that you would enlarge his capacity to be able to impact and strengthen the churches in our community. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Well, we love you, Overflow family. I love being a part of Overflow Church. It is a great season. The gospel is alive, and we've been called to carry it. So go and carry it. Join us next week for What Can I Give in Pastor Lotion. God bless you.